Hello, hi, hello. Ready for the second section of the first chapter. So because this is the second section, we are going to introduce something new, which is a look back on the previous material, which we didn't have anything to look back on in the first section. So here I, I have a couple of quick questions that will give a person a chance to feel like they're sure that they're following the main thrust of what we're talking about. So this is an easy one. They're all supposed to be relatively easy, but they're supposed to be uh, just a kind of a quick check-in. All right, so there's four linear systems, one, two, three, four. They're all in echelon form, so a person doesn't have to do the arithmetic. And it simply says, how many solutions does each one have? So for the first one, what do you think? So there is no solution here because zero equals minus one. Anytime there's a contradictory equation, you stop and say no solution. Over here, second one. So this is the one a person could be fooled by the zero equals zero. That zero equals zero does not signal that there are infinitely many solutions. That's not right. Instead, what's happening here is that there is a row led by z, there's a row led by y, there's a row led by x, and there's no contradictory row. So we're looking here, in this case, we're looking at unique solution down here. So here, again, there's a zero equals zero, but again, we're not going to be confused. There is a row led by x and there's a row led by y, but there's no row led by z. So we're looking at infinitely many solutions in this case. And finally, down to here, this fourth one. And so uh, I'm sure that at this point you, you've seen that there's a contradictory row, and so never mind the zero equals zero, never mind that there's no row led by z. No, all that doesn't matter is a contradictory row. So the answer is no solutions. Okay, so that was the first. Let's see if I can manipulate my stuff. There we go. There we go. And here's the second. It just says produce a three equations, three unknown system that has infinitely many solutions. Produce ones with no solutions and then also produce one with one solution. So I've got I to gotta produce that on a piece of paper here if I can figure out how to do this. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Produce that on a piece of paper. So I'm just going to make one up. Of course, you would make up a different one. The idea with, uh, with these systems is to produce, uh, for example, infinitely many solutions, you might produce an equation that is redundant on the other two, that is just a repeat of the other two. So let's have a look here. Uh, let's see. How about something like uh, x plus y plus z equals 1, 2x uh, uh, minus y equals 5. And then I'll just make the third row be a repeat of the other two, the information in the other two somehow. So for example, how about if I take uh, 2 times the first row and add it to the second row? So 2 times x plus 2x makes 4x. 2 times y minus y makes plus y. 2 times z plus 0 makes 2z. 2 times 1 plus 5 makes 7. And that's going to be infinitely many solutions. Okay, now if you want to have no solutions, then, then you want something like this. You want to do basically the same thing. x plus y plus z equals 1. 2x minus y equals 5. Just a couple of equations that I made up. And then over here I'm going to do 4x plus y plus 2z. And then I'll put anything but 7 here. So as long as I don't take twice the first row and add the second row, if I do something other than 7 here, I will get a contradiction because the left side is twice the first row plus the second row. The right side is not. So if I put anything but 7 there, how about uh, minus 5? No solutions. So it's about linear combinations. That's what it's about. And last, for unique solution, really the thing about unique solution is that it's what almost always happens unless you've got some very special circumstance. So I'm just going to do here, oh, how about the same first two rows, x plus y plus z equals 1, 2x minus y equals 5, and uh, 4x plus y plus z, not 2z, just plus z. So something different here. The third row is not twice the first row plus the second. And I can write anything I like over here. Oh, uh, 90, 94. Okay, and there would be unique solution. Okay, so the three things that can happen is there can be redundant, there can be a contradictory, or there should, can just be really kind of the random case of just any old jumble of things. Whoops. 
Come on, there we go. Okay. Okay, so that's what can happen in those three cases. All right, so let's bring up the material for the day. Come on, there we go. For some reason, the clicker is giving me trouble. Okay, so I want to look at uh, uh, last time we had um, solution sets that had a particular form. It was a particular vector plus the vectors that made up the, homoge the solution set of the homogeneous system, the associated homogeneous system. So that had a particular form, and last time I was, I was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, you can only do so many things at once, so I started off by introducing matrices and vectors and saying that they are, for the, for the purposes of last class, they just were holding numbers. That's all. They were just like a little database that held numbers. Well, now I want to uh, uh, introduce, it's really, I expect it to be a review, I want to introduce the geometry that vectors and, and matrices, but really vectors at the moment, represent. So the, uh, the, the thing is that there is, behind linear systems, there is a geometry. It all makes sense if you think about it geometrically. So you have to start somewhere. We started by solving them. That makes sense. But when you step back a little bit and look at what they're about, they, it, uh, that makes a lot of sense too. So here, for example, are two equation, two unknown systems, one, two, three of them. This Two equations, two unknown systems is a unique solution. You can see that the second equation is not a combination somehow, not five times the first or anything like that. This one here has no solutions. You can see that the second equation on the left-hand side is indeed just the first equation repeated, but on the right-hand side it isn't, so there's a contradiction there. No solutions. And over here you get infinitely many solutions because the second equation is really just double the first equation. It's a repeat. And when you think about the geometry, that's the three things that lines can do. When you plot these 3x plus 2y equals 7 and x minus y equals minus 1, when you plot them as lines, if they fall kind of askew here, or if they fall parallel here, or if they happen to be the same line, why then you get the three cases that can happen. So the fact that in linear systems three things can happen in these three pictures, it all makes sense now. You say, well, that's exactly what geometrically can happen. And that's indeed the, one of the advantages of the geometry is that it makes clear to a person just exactly what could conceivably be going on. A geometry is a way to understand what linear systems have to say. And we'll be looking for as many different ways to understand what systems have to say as we can grab our hands on. Okay, so I want to talk then about the geometry. So to talk about the geometry of this general solution sets that we talked about last time, I have to start by talking about vectors. What are vectors? And, and, and again, I anticipate that this is, uh, uh, for, for most folks, this is a review, that you've seen this before either in a prior math class, so let's say calculus three, for example, or maybe in a physics class, for example. Okay, so for our purposes, the, a vector geometrically will be an object consisting of a magnitude and a direction and the right way to think of it is that it models a displacement. In this case, for example, you might be going to the left by one and down by one. And that's a displacement and I've drawn that displacement as an arrow. The arrowhead, of course, points to where you end and the beginning of the arrow points to where you started. Vectors, that is to say, for example, displacements, uh, with the same magnitude in the same direction are equal. So I have a bunch of vectors drawn there uh, on the plane, and they all have the same magnitude, they all have the same direction. They are the same vector. I know that they look like they're different vectors because they're drawn in different places, but they're all the same displacement. So they're all the same vector. Each of them is an a one over and two up displacement. Okay, so if I want to if I want to write down what is the displacement, then I need to write down the start point and the end point, and then do the subtraction. B1 minus A1 is the difference in the x direction. B2 minus A2 is the difference in the y direction. So, for example, a one over two up vector is written as one two. And we often uh, we often picture a vector by starting at the origin, just because you got to start somewhere. So it's convenient to start at the origin. If you start at the origin, then vector whose components are v1 and v2, for example, one and two, will end at x equals one, y equals two, or end at v1, x equals v1, and and y equals v2. So we often say that the plane is the set of points x1 comma x2, or the plane is the set of vectors x1 x2. We won't really distinguish all that much. We'll find it convenient sometimes to blur the distinction between the point and the vector which, when started at the origin, ends at that point. 
and all this stuff, one advantage of all this stuff is that it all instantly extends to higher direction, high di higher dimensions. So three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional, and sometimes when you work with linear systems, you're working with hundreds of unknowns, you know, hundreds of equations. So you could have hundreds of dimensions in your in your vector, uh, in your collection of vectors, and so you, you know that uh, all this stuff extends immediately to, uh, to to many many dimensions. Okay. The operations that we introduced for vectors last time were addition and multiplication. Multiplication is the easier of the two, so starting with multiplication. If you multiply a vector times 3, you make it 3 times as long. Pointing in the same direction, but 3 times as long. If you multiply a, vec a, a vector by minus 1, you make it point in the other direction. If you multiply a vector by minus 3, you'd make it point in the other direction and, and, and be 3 times as long as it was before. So scalars, the 3 or the minus 1 here, rescale the vector. They, the geometry is they simply make it bigger or smaller. That's all. The, uh, the addition of two vectors, again, a familiar. I, I expect that this is a review for most folks. The addition of two vectors is um, if you add V and W, then uh, the way to construct the sum, V plus W, is you take the end point of V and the begin point of W, Put the begin point of W on top of the end point of V, and then the vector V plus W extends from the beginning of V to the end of W. Uh, again, we're thinking of vectors as being a displacement. So one way to imagine what's happening here is imagine that you're on a boat. And over the course of a minute, the boat moves this way. And you, on the boat, on top of the deck, move this way. Then combined, your motion boat, the boat underneath you and you on the deck of the boat, your combined motion is this. You often hear this described as the parallelogram rule because you draw a parallelogram and then the V plus W extends from the, from the lower corner to the upper corner. So it's got a kind of a nice picture. I want to talk about uh, some of the usual geometry things so uh, that we're going to use throughout the course of the course. So, uh, for example, a line. So uh, uh, we're used to maybe y equals mx plus b expression of a line, but we have a we have a reason to think here about the vector expression of a line. This is the uh, line that goes through one comma two and three comma one. There it is in dark. One comma two and three comma one. And you'll see that I've written that as one two plus t times 2 minus 1. So the 1, 2, of course, comes from the 1, 2, and, and there is one, there's the vector 1, 2. Where's the 2 minus 1 come from? So you take 3 minus 1 and 1 minus 2. Again, 3 minus 1 and 1 minus 2. In other words, you take the offset, so the slope take the offset and you get 2 and minus 1. So there's the 2 minus 1 that tells you how to get from the 1, 2 vector to the 3, 1 vector is the 2 minus 1 vector. Okay, and then of course this line, the dark line, is comprised of the endpoints of vectors that have this form for various t's. t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 0, t equals minus 1, t equals minus 2. Okay? All that stuff uh, uh, is, I hope, familiar from uh, previous classes. We often call that the direction vector for a line. 2 minus 1 is the direction vector for a line. And in higher dimension, you just have, instead of having two components, you might have three components, four components, five components, kind of stuff. Planes. So planes uh, work basically the same way, and you'll recognize that this has a familiar form. It has the form of the solution set of a linear system, and that's why we're talking about all this stuff. Here's a plane uh, drawn there in uh, that kind of funny color, the yellowish color. So uh, 1, 0, 5, 2, 1, minus 3, and minus 2, 4.5. So kind of just a generic plane, random plane, nothing special about it. And it consists of the endpoints of vectors in this set. You recognize the 1, 0, 5. That's actually this greenish vector here. So you recognize the 1, 0, 5. Where'd the 1, 1, minus 8 come from? Where'd the minus 3, 4, minus 4.5 come from? Well, it came from the same place that the vectors came on the previous slide. So where, for example, did the 1, 1, 8 come from? It's 2 minus 1, 1 minus 0, minus 3, take away 5. Where did the minus 3, 4, minus 4.5 come from? It's minus 2 take away 1, 4 take away 0, 0.5 take away 5. 
and that's the two red vectors that you see here. Those red vectors are drawn in the plane. This is the vector representing displacement, and this is the vector representing displacement. Okay, so the two, the vector associated with T and the vector associated with S are drawn as red. They, are, they lie in the plane. Their body lies in the plane, not just the tip. The 1, 0, 5 vector, only its tip lies in, in this drawing. Only its tip touches the plane. It starts at the origin. And then uh, those, those column vectors are, are, come from those places. A, a set of that form, a form that we at this point recognize as the solution set of a linear system, a set of that form is called a k-dimensional linear service. This is, of course, going to be a, a two-dimensional linear surface because a plane is flat, so two dimensions. A k-dimensional linear surface, sometimes called a k-flat. Okay, so this, of course, takes us back to what we talked about last time, that we are, we are talking about the solution sets of linear systems, and we can see them as having some sensible geometry. The subject is called linear algebra because everything is linear, lines, planes, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay, next time we're going to talk about length and angle measures. So um so we'll we'll we'll, we'll see you then next time if I can work my work my systems here. We'll see you then next time. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.